My name is Alicia Salmarone, and I lead strategic partnerships at Google for Education. Today, you're going to hear from students and researchers who are using GCP to discover black holes in the universe, new painkillers that could help us address the opioid crisis, as well as communication devices that can enable the deaf. Joining me today are Alon and Tomer from Columbia University, Vaikunth from Stanford Slack, and Neil from the University of Southern California. You'll hear their stories in just a moment. This quote from Ryan Abernathy, a climate researcher at Columbia University, really says it all for me. The amount of data in academic as well as scientific research is exploding. And researchers really have no option but to look to the cloud. But what the cloud is enabling them to do is to make discoveries faster. Ryan used GCP in his lab, and he made note that he's able to ask more questions, different questions. Take a moment to read that last line. Really hits home, doesn't it? We have two programs that enable students and researchers to get started on GCP at no cost. The first is the Education Faculty Grants Program. This program provides free credits to faculty who, do, who want to use GCP in their courses with their students. Courses from com, uh, computer science to engineering, as well as business operations and anything revolving data science are already leveraging GCP credits. Oh, apologies. Our second program is the GCP Research Credits Program. Researchers can apply for free credits, and they can use this in their lab for any type of evaluation, experimentation, um, or testing. We have researchers sequencing genomes, uh, learning and researching about life forms in the galaxies far away, and as well as far deep underneath, um, not underneath the ocean floor, but near the ocean floor. <laughs> so with that, I would love to introduce our first presentation from Tomer and Alon at Columbia University. Imagine not being able to call your loved ones. Imagine not being able to call 911 during an emergency. Imagine someone was listening to every single phone call you made. You don't have to imagine. 37.5 million adults in the US report suffering from some sort of hearing loss. That's 15% of the US population. What do these people do? How do they place phone calls? Well, today, People with hearing disabilities have to use a captioning service. What that means is, if I want to call a friend who's hard of hearing, I'm being transferred to a man in the middle. That's an actual human being listening to everything I say, type it, and send it to a special device that the other side must own. Think about it for a second. It can take almost a minute from the moment I say something to the time the other side hears it. This is crazy. Let's don't even talk about privacy. Someone is listening to everything I say. The year is 2019. We have self-driving cars. We created rockets that can go out to space and land back on Earth. And still, if you have trouble hearing, if you're hard of speaking, there is no way for you to make a decent phone call. We want to change that. That's why we created Nagish. Nagish stands for accessible in Hebrew. And our mission is to make phone calls more accessible. How we do that? To explain, I'd like to call my partner, Alon Ezra, to the stage. All right. So. I want to go back to the captioning service Tomer just mentioned and tell you a short story that happened to me. So I wanted to contact Jack from the New York Deaf Association to talk about collaboration, offer him beta testing for free, 
and just hear his opinion. But I was connected to a captioning service. And that was a little bit strange for me because that was the first time I really encountered that. And by the end of the conversation, it even became more awkward. I was telling Jack about this new service that Tomer just introduced that will take away the work from the captioning service. And they had to do it through the captioning service. <laughs> so I didn't, it didn't feel right. And I felt like there's no privacy. And I can't even imagine how Jack feels every single day. So now, that's why we created Nagish. We want to bring privacy and independence back to phone calls. So Jack can be just on the go, use his phone whenever he wants. So how would that conversation look like today using Nagish? Instead of captioning service and a man in the middle that transcribes everything I say back and forth and it's slow, tedious process, we just use Google speech to text API, which basically takes my voice, my sound, and converts it into text. That text we send to Jack mobile phone. And now he can just read what I said. Simple enough. Now if Jack wants to respond back, he can use Google Hangouts, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Telegram, and many more that we're planning to support in the future, and just respond, type back, send the message. When he sends the message, we convert it back to speech, to voice, and we send it to my phone. And I hear exactly what Jack typed. And now we're both happy again, and we have a normal phone call like any other person in the world, and simple as that. If this is cool, the coolest part is we were able to build it in less than 12 hours. We started in a coding competition in our school, Columbia University, and with Google products, we were able to have a working demo by the end of the day. And to show you how Nagish works, here's a video. Hola, me gustaría reservar una mesa para dos a las ocho de la noche. Por supuesto, bajo cuál nombre? Jonathan. Perfecto, te esperamos. Thank you. So, as you can see, we're pretty excited by this. But the question that we must ask is, where can we go next? So, we're currently working with beta testers to test our service, improve it, and make it really something that they can use every single day. Uh, besides that, we have conference calls that we want to make them more, we want to make, you want to use Nagish in a more professional way, so they can use it while they work. Yeah. Also. We wanted to create personalized voices. So, for instance, adults won't have the same voice as child. We feel like that each person should have the unique voice, even if they can't speak. If you want to hear more about Nagish and read about what we're doing, check out our website at talknagish.co, where you'd also find a live transcript of this keynote that was generated using the same technology that empowers Nagish. And if you would like to see a live demo, please find us at the Google for Education booth right after this talk. And we're going to be there until the end of the day. Hope to see you. And now, Vaikun is coming to, stay, to speak about space. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, before I begin, I just have a question. Uh, did any of you get a chance to uh, check out the latest news today about the first ever photo of a black hole? It just came out this morning, right? Right. So. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about similar things here. 
hopefully that gets you excited. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Vaikunt and uh, I'm a researcher at Stanford uh, at Slack National Lab just down the road from here. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about unlocking a vast trove of data to study the secrets of the universe, uh, cool things like dark matter and dark energy. 96%, this might surprise you, but we don't know 96% of what's out there in the universe. Everything you see in that photo, tens of thousands of galaxies, our own galaxy, our tables, our chairs, you and me, every single thing only comprises 4% of the matter in the universe. That's a lot. We don't know what's out there. 96% is what we need to find out. So to unlock the secrets of that 96%, we're going to need a lot of information. The universe, just by virtue of existing, provides us with this information all around us. We need a way to collect that information and then study it to be able to study what's going on. This is where I come in. My job as a researcher is to create a system that is able to collect all this information and provide a platform for astrophysicists and astronomers and any scientist who's interested to study the data and look into the secrets of the universe. And with Google, we've also been able to create a platform that helps us do that. For the data management system, we're going to need a telescope to power uh, the images that give us all that data. This is where LSST comes in. It's called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. This telescope will provide the deepest, widest image of the universe to date. It's going to be the world's biggest camera-based telescope. Every single picture that you see online, even the one that came out today, it comes from collaborating with a bunch of other telescopes, uh, taking lots and lots of exposures, tons of analysis done on them, uh, lots of algorithms. That eventually gives you a nice, pretty picture that you can look at. Now, how do you do that for hundreds or thousands and, in the end, millions of pictures? We're going to need a really huge machine. This is where LSST comes in. It's a project being built in Chile right now. And uh, the next video will show you a sense of scale of what this telescope is about. So uh, yeah, that should give you an idea of uh, what's going on. It's, it takes hundreds of people, thousands of scientists to uh, make this thing, and it's been envisioned you know, over 10 years ago. It finally got funding in like 2010, and uh, it's been under construction since. It's going to be in production in about 2021, 22, and it'll provide us with all these images that we can look at. So how big is this telescope exactly? Uh, the camera behind this telescope is 3,200 megapixels. Uh, just think of your cell phone, you know, the best ones are usually 10 to 12 megapixels, and those are, take pretty nice photos. Every single exposure with this telescope is 3,200 megapixels. That's about the size of 40 full moons, one image. It takes one of these images every 15 seconds, and it's going to do that over 10 years, from 2021 to 2030-ish. Uh, that ends up being 15 terabytes of data per night, and in the end, 37 billion stars and galaxies for us to look at. It's a lot of information in that database in the end. So with all these hundreds of scientists, thousands of uh, people that, want to, that are interested in this data, that want to discover new things from this survey of the sky, we're going to need a data management platform that can easily enable them to do that. So currently, uh, LSST is based in Chile and with scientists, uh, collaborating with scientists in the US. Imagine there's a scientist in Australia who's also interested in uh, studying dark matter and dark energy via their own telescope or their own collaboration, and they've never had anything to do with LSST before. They have information about weak lensing, for example, which is one way to study a dark matter and dark energy. One of the ways that scientists make progress on measurements and equations is to combine measurements and iterate on current, uh, current accepted values. They can bring their own data 
spin up everything that we've provided in Google Cloud with our data management system, with our services, with our data, compare it against what they have at, a, at their own cost, which enables them to combine into a new measurement for dark matter, and dark matter and dark energy. Cost is, of course, a part of any equation uh, on campus because uh, that, that's really important uh, when it comes to researchers because we always rely on government funding. This brings us to the proof of concept that LSST worked with, uh, with Google. This was practically an exercise in running our data management system that has been planned uh, for the operation of the telescope and running it in the cloud. This means we took our database system, our associated services, uh, things that we containerized and Kubernetesized, made it, made it easy available and deployable by others and not just experts, uh, and run them on GCP. And the way we uh, compared performance was by uh, benchmarking uh, things that we already done on our own data centers and with things called KPMs or key performance metrics. Uh, this, was, this is an ongoing study. I cannot really uh, talk too much about the numbers, uh, but in certain cases, in certain classes of queries that scientists like to run, we saw improvements of up to 10x uh, in, in the times that uh, it takes to get results out of queries. One of the things that I do want to mention throughout our proof of concept is that the Google professional services people were really helpful and hands-on in uh, helping us bring our entire data management system onto the cloud which really made things easy. And in the end, that is our objective, to create a system that's easy, flexible to use, and uh, other scientists and non-experts should be able to uh, use as well. So for other researchers thinking about getting on the cloud, I wanna talk about a special point, which is uh, every researcher, every type of research, not just astronomy, not just uh, biology, and not just, uh, literally everything has special requirements because there's very specific ways to do things, and, uh, that's, that's really, it's, it's really bespoke to the type of analysis that you're doing. It's sometimes difficult to think that it would be possible to do that somewhere else and not just your own system, your own data center, your own specialized system that you've created. Uh, but I wanted to talk about how we were able to do that still at GCP. For example, one of the things that uh, we've done in our system is something called shared scans. Uh, and what that does is when you submit a query that looks at the entire data, which is a very frequent thing that scientists like to do, any further query that comes into uh, the system tags along and it adds no further overhead to the system. And that way we can look at the entire data set for one query or 100 queries and it should work exactly the same. Uh, another specific thing that uh, astronomers need for LSST is uh, something called spherical geometry. Uh, think, of, think about Google Maps for a second. When you kind of scroll out, you see that uh, the coordinates are in a, in a sphere, right? You zoom out and you look at distances between two points, it's actually a curve. In the same way, when we're taking photos of the night sky and all these images, if you think about it, we're in the center of that globe. So we need an accurate way to uh, look for objects around other objects, distances between things, accurately with, that, uh, with spherical geometry in mind so we can uh, calculate those things accurately. Uh, things like that were also adaptable in things like BigQuery where we could make special UDFs and uh, other functions to be able to do that in the way that we need. So I can go on and on about all the specific things that we did and tried, uh, but if you're interested more about the LSST data management team, uh, you can find out more in that link. And ultimately what I want to say is that our objective is to build a system that is really easy to use, flexible for other scientists, for other non-experts, uh, and really enable science output out of this experiment for as many papers as possible, and uh, have, the, have the scientists concentrate more on uh, delivering science results rather than uh, worrying about the underlying technology. Because after all, we still have 96% of the universe left to understand. Uh, with that, I will hand over to the next speaker, Neil, who would like to talk about the opioid crisis. Thank you, Vaikund. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nilkan Patel, and I am a graduate student at the University of Southern California. And today I'm going to share a story about fight against the opioid epidemic in the Google Cloud. What we are trying to do here is to design better drug, better painkillers, faster. What takes more than a year in a normal research lab takes less than a day on Google Cloud. Opioid epidemic. So the US is currently facing a true national emergency as opioid epidemic. And 
more than 130 people every day or close to 50,000 people every year die because of opioid epidemic. To put this in perspective, this number is even higher than people dying from car accidents. In fact, in the next 10 minutes while I do this talk, one person will die because of opioids in the US. So let's look at where this started. The use of opioids dates back to even centuries, and its social and cultural impacts can still be found in early civilizations, including Romans and the Egyptians. Back then, it was all derived from natural products. It was derived from poppies. But now, as you can see here, it has gone totally synthetic. It has become much more powerful and much more addictive. Back then, it had impacted human history and wars were fought because of opioids. One such example is the first opium war which was fought between British-backed East India Company and the Chinese Kingdom. Back then, we only had morphine, which was derived from poppy. But with even more powerful synthetic opioids, nowadays, the challenges become even more grave. And take a look at the map of the US and see how it's impacting the US at the every level of income, culture, and race. Take a moment and find the region you belong to and see how severely it's impacted by the opioid epidemic. So let me switch the gears and see uh, how this works in terms of biology. So in layman's term, you can think of these opioid drugs as keys. Keys which binds to a set of proteins in our brain called the opioid receptors. So human body is made up of cells and cells have cell walls engulfing them. And the cell membranes have these gatekeepers or these opioid receptors sitting across the membrane. And when these keys or external molecules bind to these receptors, either they activate them or they block them. And when it comes to pain management, in the brain there are two major pathways. One pathway leads to pain relief, which is desired effect, but activating other pathway leads to undesired side effects, such as respiratory depression and tolerance. So whether drug will activate one pathway or another, or it will block the receptor, it depends on the structure of these keys or the drugs and how they interact with this, these receptors. So you don't really have a choice as to whether you want to get addicted or not. It's not in our hands. It's up to these receptors and how they function in our brains. So here is a short visualization. It's actually a molecular dynamic simulation showing an opioid drug binding to an opioid receptor. So in purple, this drug and the blue spirals is the opioid receptor. So our answer to fight this challenge of opioid epidemic is to design and find better keys keys that bind these receptors. And our lab has been working on these targets since more than a decade. So here is what we are gonna to do to fight, fight this. We and our colleagues have solved the atomic level 3D structures of these receptors or these locks. And once you know how these locks work, then you can design and screen better keys. So once we have the description, or three-dimensional description of these uh, receptors, then we throw in a bunch of keys or small drug-like molecules and find those ones which can interact with these keys, these locks, and show desired effect. So here is where the action happens, actually. So in this uh, video, what it may look like a bunch of th things happening, what is actually showing is we are screening different keys. And this process is called virtual ligand screening. In this process, we evaluate a single drug molecule in different of docking poses, and we calculate uh, different chemical interactions for them. And uh, in this process, there are thousands of different orientations which are evaluated for every single drug. And this process happens for hundreds of millions of drug-like compounds. So you might be wondering, why is this important? So by this process, we can find most promising drug-like candidates. 
And then we can select them and test them actually in the lab. And here, the story gets even more interesting. In the past two years, the size of these small drug-like molecule libraries have grown rapidly. What used to be in tens of millions a few years ago is now have grown to more than a billion in size. So while this presents a great challenge in terms of size of the problem and computability, this presents a unique opportunity in terms of exploring the ever-expanding chemical space to have more options to find better drug-like chemicals from. So in a nutshell, what's worked for us is the speed at which we can do computations on the cloud. So let me give you a simple comparison. Uh, what we have in our lab is on the left. It's usually 500 processors. And what we have on the cloud so you are using almost 200,000 processor processors in parallel at a given point in time. And what used to take more than a year to screen at a such a scale now takes less than a day or two on the cloud. So far uh, in this story, which began almost a year ago with the help of National Institute of Health and its program on pilot, uh, uh, its pilot program on cloud computing, and uh, uh, also with the help from NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, and Google uh, Research Credit Programs, uh, we screened almost half a billion of such drug-like compounds. And we selected 120 compounds and tested them in the lab. And indeed, we found some of the promising compounds uh, which have shown uh, desired signaling profiles. So we'll continue our fight against the opioid epidemic in the cloud uh, in the hope of saving millions of lives and changing the faces of the addiction. With that, I'd like to thank you all, and special thanks to my mentor, Professor Vassalot Katrich, and Sarosh and Albert from Google, and Jim from Onyx. Tomar and Alan, um, I thought it was fantastic that you're able to get, uh, get going with a prototype in one day at a campus hackathon. Um, what would advice be, what would the advice be that you would give to other students that are looking to get started on GCP? Um, so I think when I got started with GCP, um, I didn't have much programming experience. Um, I took a few classes, but not more than that. And what I would say is just go and try stuff. I failed my first hackathon, um, and we won the second one, and I think everyone that we went to since then. Uh, so just keep trying, do crazy stuff, do easy stuff, then go to stuff that are harder, and, and keep trying. The GCP console makes it really easy to achieve great stuff. I, think, I mean, I think uh, Tomer covered most of it. Like he said, Biggie, from easy things, like. Uh, Google Translate API is very simple to use, and you can have a result in a minute, and it's very satisfying, so maybe try that.